Hi, Meg. Hello. Welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having Last me. time we recorded, um, the recording took two and a half hours. Yeah, I mean, so did the conversation. It wasn't just the recording. <laughs> I think the conversation <laughs> yeah. was even longer. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it was. Yes. yes. Um, so welcome back. And I usually start with a question, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And I'm aware that this question might trigger a different conversation mm. this sure. time than last time. Uh, okay, so should we start with that one again? I think I have the same answer, though. <laughs> Let's dive right into the conversation. Sure. We um, briefly, before hitting the record button, discussed what we could talk about. Mm -hmm. And diversity and inclusion was one topic. And our mindset towards our participants was the other topic. And somehow they're related. Yeah. So let's start with a harsh statement or provocative statement. Are we judging our participants? I think that the, like, I call it the myth of neutrality in facilitation. <laughs> like the idea that you are supposed to be going to be or are neutral is like a myth, um, I think. And I think it's a dangerous one in that um, I think it's far more productive to deal with your biases, um, like at least personally deal with that, them um, then it is to pretend that you're neutral. I mm -hmm. used to teach people how to run gender and sexuality trainings, right? Like there was this three hour curriculum that we had and we would spend two days doing train the trainers where we would teach people how to run this three hour curriculum. And almost to a T every single time we did that, people said, okay, so I know as a facilitator, I'm supposed to be neutral. And we would be like, <laughs> No. And we would literally like jokingly like hold up the curriculum and be like, this is rainbow, right? Like this is coming <laughs> from a perspective. This has a pro LGBTQ lens. Like this doesn't believe that all, you know, all viewpoints are equally valuable and equally um, desirable, right? Like this has a perspective. We want you to be pro LGBTQ, right? Like, and so, but that doesn't mean like, that doesn't mean that a participant who comes in and disagrees with that conclusion that says something ignorant that it, or even says something that like is, it is, um, you know, bigoted that you shouldn't be able to receive that person as someone with the potential to learn something. Mm. right or the potential to change or the potential to be like if you say this is a safe space we want you to bring your questions your comments your concerns your ideas your beliefs into this space this is what it's for it's a learning environment and then you don't have the ability to hold people who disagree with you in a generous way like that is a problem. And that is so much better to me than neutrality because what people think they're aspiring to with neutrality is like, I'm not gonna shut anyone down. And I'm like that, you don't have to be neutral in order to not do that. I love that because it just points at different perspectives on the term neutrality. Because I think as human beings, we cannot be neutral. And if we were neutral, nobody would hire us as facilitators. Because if you're 100% neutral and can be replaced by, by a machine, basically, mm -hmm. then you're not guiding the group into a direction. You're not provoking them. You're not maybe speaking out the non -set. And still, I believe that a facilitator must be neutral in terms of the outcomes or the results of the conversation. Yeah. I so for me, that... that's a neutrality that counts. So I, I don't want, if I have already a set mindset of where the conversation, where the group is supposed to go, then I wouldn't call this a facilitated process. Sure. I think, um, 
I mean, there's that, there's that language of like open to outcome, right. Uh, that I think is, uh, I think I like a cornerstone of a lot of facilitation is that like, we're open to, to the outcome. I think that some people are brought in to be facilitators of an outcome and you don't know how you're going to get the group there. Like we know this is where we need to land. I need you to help me get the group there and, and like get their buy-in. And some people I think would say like, that's not facilitation. That's, you know, something else. And I think other people would say, I'm making it easier for them to get there together and to move through a process. And like, that is okay. Um, and I mean, like for, for me with a lot of the social justice education that I did, I had a goal, you know, mm -hmm. like it wasn't maybe going to be accomplished that day, but like, I do want you to leave more open or for like the gender and sexuality work. Like I want you to leave more open, curious, interested, you know, accepting of, of queer sexualities and, and non, you know, straightforward and normative genders. And like, if that doesn't happen, like, that's my, I'm, I'm facilitating you towards a specific end, you know, but how you get there and whether you get there, what that means to get there today, like that's all really open. And I would like to connect this back to the first question. So if, if you have a very specific outcome or transformation, transformation mm -hmm. for your participants in mind, you want them to, to leave as open-minded, better educated, more tolerant, and maybe even activated to take action. Sure. What if they don't go there? So, and I think, and this is where it becomes interesting. How can you have this specific goal for the, behavioral transformation or even mindset transformation for them to happen without judging them. And then for me, this is relates to the core facilitation skill of neutrality. I would say the lack of judgment, or at least, yeah. And then the question is, can we, is it, can we as humans stop judging our participants and how do you deal with the fact that if someone doesn't leave the space, with the new mindset that you aspired, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I have so, so many thoughts on this. Okay, so I would say that the way you're using neutrality, I or I, I would replace with the word openness. Mm -hmm. That there there is a level of openness that you need to have, um, and a and a level of like equanimity, perhaps. Like I don't. This is this is I would say like for me, like I don't. I don't know if this is true for every facilitator. I think some people could probably do this in entirely different ways that would really work. Um, but for me, like there's a level of like steadiness that I need to have in order, I think, for people not to, um, yeah, to not feel judgment shuts down people's ability to be curious, right? I think it's very hard to be curious and judgmental at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people feel judged, it, they also move into a defensive stance, right? Yeah. And so as, as like a social justice facilitator, I, I am doing my best to avoid the need for you to defend yourself, right? Because that's not going to get us anywhere unless I'm trying to like go into the defensive, like I want to bring it up so we can look at it, you know, like then I think it could be helpful. But most of the time, it's actually just going to serve as a block to like, it's going to create like a barrier to where I want to go. And right. it puts it endangers the safe space that we are there to nurture. I think that if the space is supposed to be about education, exploration, open mindedness, then any then like defensiveness gets in the way of us being curious about what's going on. Right. Mm. And so I want to not. I want to not activate that in my participants as much as possible. Like, I don't, I don't want you to feel like you have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. I actually want to like do something else with you. Right. I want to go other places. And I think the, yeah, what we want to do then with this, maybe even provocation is to help them to wonder, maybe even question their own or be curious about their own reflective process instead yeah. of defending and finding why they're, reflecting on a certain topic the way they do become curious about their own process. Yeah. I think that, um, 
to me, like that's what you can facilitate that other people aren't going to do in other spaces, right? Is like for me, um, there was a lot of times where all of us, no matter like what mindset we we're coming in with, that we were we were in it and we we didn't examine it or or question it, right? And for um and and that I what I, what I wanted to do is inspire a like a curiosity or a potential like crack in in your in your belief system, right? And then be mm-hmm. like, hey, let's like shine some light in there and like see what's going on. And to me, that yeah, that means like, I want you to be curious about this thing that you're bringing here. Right. Yeah. Or I want to like reflect something that I'm seeing that maybe you haven't, but to me, like some of the the thing that I'm asking you to do, be curious, be open, be like, you know, like explorative of our ideas here. If I'm unwilling to do that for you, like then it's a, it's like a hypocritical energy that yeah. I think really shuts down a lot of the, um, the curiosity Absolutely. that you're wanting to inspire in other people. And if I can like respond to your question of like lack of judgment, I don't think I I read somewhere that like humans can't do negative commands, right? Like don't think of a purple elephant. You have to go like purple elephant. Don't. Oh, okay. Like, you know, like, or don't pet the dog. Your, your brain goes like pet the dog. Don't pet the dog. Right. Like, like, like you have to do the positive command and then cancel it out. And so I don't think like there is, you know, in like maybe like Buddhist tradition, like a lack of judgment, like there's that kind of just like, I'm just not going to have energy going into that system. I find that to be quite difficult. I think Mm -hmm. it's far easier to change the energy that you are applying than to suck the energy out of a system rather than to like say, I used to be really judgmental and now I'm really curious And that's what I would say is like, I don't think that people should stop judging their participants. I think it's incredibly difficult to stop something. I think it is far easier to shift from like, if you are judging your participants, I want to invite you into being curious, like deeply take that same level of energy and move it into a curiosity place instead of into a judgment place. It's not a lack of judgment. I think it is a positive orientation towards Mm -hmm. something else. Because it also infects the way how we enter the room with judgment or with curiosity infects the entire space and the behavior that happens within that. And I still wonder, we have such high expectations of our participants, right? In general, We want them to be open-minded and to be curious and to ask questions and to brainstorm, hence to be creative, to think out of the box, to be collaborative. There's so many attributes we're expecting the individuals to have. And what if they don't? I think... I don't know I think being curious and open-minded, it's so difficult. Can we actually expect that from our participants? And how do we deal with it if they aren't? It's a really good question about expectation of participants. Because I don't, my initial thought is like, I don't know if I, I, I hope that they come. Okay, so here's what I would say. Like I try to let people know what they're walking into. And I've I've like talked about this a couple of different ways when I'm teaching people how to facilitate, right? I'm like, okay, you walk into this room and all the chairs are in rows, all fa- facing the front. What type of space, what type of like experience do you think you're about to have, right? And they're like, I think we're about to do like a lecture. And I was like, cool. Now they're at tables, like facing each other. There's still like a front of the room, but like you're in like little pods. And they're like, yeah, okay. I'm like expecting to participate with each other, right? And that we're going to do some like little small group work at some point. And I was like, okay. And if they're in a circle and there's no tables in front of them, what feeling comes up on that? And they're like, oh, we're about to like get super vulnerable. And like, you know, like I feel very exposed and like, it's wild. If you put chairs in a circle versus chairs in a circle with desks in front of them, like the level of vulnerability is so different, Mm -hmm. right? So to me as a facilitator, like 
I have different expectations of participants in either in all of those settings. And I think it's important to forecast the type of thing that you're about to do with people. If people walk in being like, I am about to get a lecture and then they see chairs in a circle, they're going to be like, oh, I was not prepared. I did not drink enough coffee for this, you know, like, or I was not prepared for this this morning. And to me, like that's a mismatch of, of like expectation and reality. And I want to like, and so, and what's tricky on zoom is that that type of forecasting doesn't exist. It yeah. looks the same every time. Right. So in online spaces, like I'm often trying to communicate to my participants ahead of time. This is what you can expect from the experience, right? Like it's going to be participatory. There's going to be breakout groups. Like I'm going to have, you know, we're going to do some self-reflection and that's to communicate some of the explicit expectations that I have of them. Right. But I, I don't actually usually curate their mindset much more than expectations around participation. Like, I don't say like, come curious, come open. I usually say like, come ready to participate. Come as you are. That's, that's going to happen. Right. I'm going to ask you to mm -hmm. participate. And like, there's still, some people will drop off the call. Some people will not really talk in their breakout rooms. Like those are ways that they still have agency in those, in those moments. And then to me, like everything that you were describing, I was like, no, that's my expectation of me. Like my expectation is to far exceed where my participants are to make it easier for them to be here. Like I'm holding my hands up and most people are gonna be listening to this. So like, to me, if I want your curiosity to be at like a, if I want you to have some curiosity, like, and it, it's at a three, like mine needs to be at a seven, you know, mm -hmm. or an eight. Like I have really high expectations of myself and the types of energy and the types of, um, yeah, like if I'm asking you to do something, I'm usually going to do it to a greater extent, not in, in all cases, um, like in the sense that I think you can be like overly vulnerable with your participants. And then I think that's actually kind of dangerous because it makes them take care of you, like in a way that I think is really un unhelpful. But most of the time with like curiosity, openness, like energy, I'm going to try to be higher than where mm. I'm, I'm hoping you are. But to me, like, I don't, I don't have expectations of my participants being able to just do those things to me, like as a facilitator, I have expectations that the structures that I have created, the environments that I am shaping will make it easy for you to do that. Will will like create a where that is the path of least resistance for you, but that's I don't actually think it's like oh, you just suck today and <laughs> and uh and I did all I could. Like that's that can happen, but most of the time I find like you're not setting me up for success. Like there's times where Meg goes into a session as a participant and I can come with like all the openness and energy in the world, but if the structures aren't set up for me to like succeed and they make me feel like uncomfortable or stunted or whatever, like the, to me, it's, we have a lot of power as a facilitator to invite people to, sh to, uh, you know, to create a path of least resistance for people. And then they have to, you know, they have to go down and they have to match yeah. us. Um, thank you. I want to point out a few things. And one, I just want to articulate my awe <laughs> so, um, of what just happened. So mm. you were articulating with your hands. Mm. And we're so aware that although we are recording this and we see each other's videos, you still had the audience, the podcast audience in mind and could in a split second catch yourself, oh, I'm showing something that I'm not articulating. So I need to put some words into it so that those who only listen to us, but don't see us can also follow. And I think this is just, it, it shows the mastery of facilitation and just underlines of what you mentioned is this awareness of how the participants are supposed to be and how you can make it easy for them to be themselves and to follow the structures, whatever you have designed for them. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, the other thing that came to my mind was that I totally hear you and I think that it's, it's an art to really be able to have such high standards towards yourself and um, 
welcome the group and the participants where they are. And still, at least I hear very often complaints about the ideas are not good enough, or they have the cameras off, or they are difficult personalities. Okay. And this is what I had in mind with my question, all this judgment around participants that consciously or unconsciously, because at some point we we fall in love with our designs. We we put so much care into our workshops and we think that we have thought of everything. And then <laughs> unthankful kids <laughs> don't even see the beauty, don't even turn their cameras on. I do think that's a huge problem. Like I think I, I think that's a huge problem in the sense that um we see them as the problem. And I think that that's like if your workshop needs your participants to show up in a very specific, like how narrow a window do they have? Like if they don't show up ready to participate, open, curious, like, you know, willing to listen to each, all these things, then the whole workshop isn't going to work. I'm like, you know, like how big a, how, how flexible is your, is setting your setting them up for success? Yeah. And, yeah, what and we, how yeah. flexible, mm -hmm. how flex, like if you need, if you need very specific things for your workshop to work, then I would say, um, you know, that's, that's great. Do it in a cohort where you can control that. Right. Or do like, if you, it, I think it's a real problem when facilitators decide that the participants are the problem. Mm. Like if your workshop isn't working, then maybe you designed a workshop that doesn't meet the group right where they are in this in in the very literal sense of like they're not willing to have their cameras on what did you design around that okay like that's not that's not them being a problem that is your design not being appropriate for where the group how the group is showing up like to me it it kind of like alleviate when i hear facilitators do that it, it to me it feels like we're alleviating ourselves of responsibility and we're just like Ugh, they sucked today and i'm like what did, did you do <laughs> all mm -hmm. the things that you had the power to do in order to like m match them to like meet them there, you know? Cause like it, if I'll, I'll ask a question of, of the people when, when I'm getting hired for online workshops and I'll say like, what is the norm around cameras on or cameras off? And they're like, oh, they're a pretty like camera on group. I'm like, okay, great. And if they're not, then I can either say, I need us to communicate that that's an expectation ahead of time or I can decide, okay, I have to be able to run this facilitation without their cameras on. Mm -hmm. And if I find that tricky, that's mine to figure out. That's not yeah. them to adjust to, right? So I think like, to me, there's a, a real, um, there's sometimes we let ourselves off the hook and we just say like, it's because my participants sucked. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, okay. And like, you can't control them. You only can control you. Yeah, so what right. are all of the, rarely do I think, have we done all we can, right? Like if you find it triggering that your participants have their cameras off, that's actually yours to deal with. That's not theirs to change. Right. Or you didn't communicate this expectation ahead of time and they, you know, showed up differently than you thought it was. It's not that you can't have difficult participants. I actually do think we have difficult participants, but I don't, I just think that like when it's the entire design is reliant on a particular, you know, like the group needs to show up like this or it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't communicate those expectations up ahead of time. Like to me, a lot of my sessions don't work if people par don't participate. They just won't be three hour sessions. I can lecture them for like, you know, if you don't want to participate, we're going to take a three hour session and I'm going to turn into a 45 minute lecture and then we're going to be kind of done. You know what I mean? And it's not going to yeah. be nearly as fun or interesting. So there, my sessions don't work if people don't participate. And so I communicate ahead of time. There's an expectation of participation. And then I make it as easy as possible for you to participate, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't rely on participation in the large group the entire time, you know, like that kind of thing. And I think if it did, that would be on me to change. And thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, I totally relate to that. And I must say that a brief from a client that says, usually the cameras are off, 
I'm like, oh, ready for the challenge. <laughs> These are one of my favorites um, to see how long it will take for them to turn the cameras on. And usually it's faster than expected. Yeah. And when I hear you speaking and all these design bits that we can do to really make sure that we get the engagement from the group, um, the engagement that we expect or hope for, for me, it sounds like, how can we make it inclusive? So how can we include all the types of possible participants to engage in the shape or form that they would like to? So, and inclusivity has been a buzzword over the past month or maybe year, and I think it's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. What does inclusivity mean to you and where do we get it wrong well i think um i think some of the uh struggles that i have with diversity and inclusion work um especially with those terminology is that they just mean so many things and i think when that is true um people can can use it for so many different purposes and uh, and then we we just don't have any we don't have any agreement and there's also just like no there's no teeth behind it there's no there's no specificity and therefore there's no way to hold people accountable to it there's no agreed upon definition so like what you just said of like it's more inclusive right i would say yeah it, it is like you're you're i think if you're designing for lots of different types of participation then you're going to get you're more likely to invite a wider range of voices into the room when i hear the terms diversity and inclusion i often um i put quotes around that mm -hmm. um like I often think of historically marginalized groups, historically marginalized populations, identities, power dynamics, right? Like patriarchy, sexism, uh, racism, homophobia, transphobia, right? Like those words also come to mind. And I don't think the word inclusion and in, like what we just described, I don't think that inherently is dealing with power dynamics, right? Um, in that same way. I think it it might, but it also might not. And, and a lot of, to me, like one of the things I don't, that I find really tricky about a lot of diversity and inclusion work is that I think some people are like, we need diversity and inclusion work so that we can address racism. And other people are like, well, we just need to be more inclusive in general, you know, like, and, and I'm like, okay, those are really different goals, right? Like one is to like, end uh, structural oppression. Um, or not even just structural, but just like it, it is to address a, a, like an oppressive system. And one is to like make it easier for somebody to say something in a group. And mm. like, it's not that those can't be related, but do we see how just enormously different those like goals are in a practical sense or, and that we use the word inclusion to mean both. Like yeah. to me, like that's a, that's a risky thing we do <laughs> to, to make it that broad, right. Of like, I want to run a more inclusive session. And I'm like, use a different, like at this point, I would say, use a different word to tell me what you want to do. Mm. I want the introverts to speak. Perfect. I want to make sure that the women in my session feel just as valued for their opinions as the men in my session. Great. I want to make sure that people of color know that their voices like really matter and that I'm not going to uh, allow them to just be like shouted down because they're the minority in the room. Perfect. Right. I want to make sure that people who are uh, neurotypical and neuroatypical have access to all of my information. Great. Those are all things that people could mean by saying inclusive. And I don't think that it's likely that one person, when they're saying, I want my session to be more inclusive, is saying all of those things. And I wonder, so thank you for, for describing the complexity. Mm -hmm. And still wonder whether it could be, at least when we have not the goal of creating more inclusive societies um, in the first step, but maybe more inclusive ways of communication or sessions, mm -hmm. whether 
it cannot be a design challenge, whether it's a design challenge that could cover all of the above. Isn't it the way how we invite groups and how we design for small group versus large group conversations, how we brief the individuals and participants before they are leaving into a breakout room to make sure that everyone there gets to speak independent of their gender, their color, um, their age, their status, abilities. Yeah. So I'll just give you, yeah, I would say, um, part of me wants to say yes. And part of me thinks that just the term diversity inclusion is used so broadly that I think there are times where like, you actually don't want an inclusive session. You want something else and you're, you're, but you're putting it under that umbrella. So let me see if I can come up with an example really briefly. There are people I know who do diversity and inclusion work, right? And if I said, like, what is your goal in this session? They would say, or like, for example, they might say, I want the people of color in the room to, to feel like they get to speak their truth and they get to speak like truth to power and share their stories. And I really want the, the, the white people that they work with to like understand what it is like for them to work in this environment. Right. And I think a lot of people would hear that and go, yeah, that sounds like a DEI workshop. That might be optimizing for particular people's voices, particular stories, and actually shutting down other people and saying, you don't get to talk. Right. And you might even say like, okay, we're actually going to run a diversity and inclusion session. This is only for people of color, right. To, to be able to share that like space ahead of time so that when they come together as so we, when we all come together as a large group those people know like each other's stories already they already have each other's backs they're able to like you know be supportive in this particular way that first session specifically exclusive right mm -hmm. like you are not welcome here and it is for what people would call inclusive reasons right like it is for like a dei reason that we are creating exclusive exclusive spaces or we might even say like we're actually going to do an experiment in this like 10 10 minutes all the men in the room you are not allowed to talk for the next 10 minutes you are only allowed to listen is that an inclusive practice no but it is for a goal right mm -hmm. that we put under this word inclusion and then i think it confuses the shit out of people I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but like it, yeah. I, it really confuses people because then you have people who go, I thought this was about inclusion. Why are you telling me I can't speak? I thought you, this was about inclusion. Why are you telling me I can't go to this session? I thought this was about inclusion. Why are you prioritizing blank, blank, blank? And this is where I think we like really trip ourselves up is that like we have said inclusion is the goal. And then there are so many both like means and ways we get there yeah. that are specifically exclusive like exclusionary practices that that are like supportive of that goal but also like I'm not sure if that's what we mean all the time like versus a more <laughs> equitable society a more like dignified society like I'm not sure if inclusion is always the goal and and yet we use that language for it and I think we've I think we've pigeonhole ourselves into fighting uh things that I don't mm. I don't think are worth I I think that term is so big and so broad and so non-specific that it's it's confusing to the average person mm. and that a lot of times we actually are trying to create exclusive spaces men's groups gay bars like all of, like there's those spaces exist you know in ex and to for a be, specific reason for good yeah. reason we and like to hang in, out they're not inclusion yeah. they're not inclusive and <laughs> and that's okay yes you know? uh and i love the how with the, every um every topic we just decompose the complexity and i wonder whether two things come to my mind one is a similar conversation that we had in public around discrimination and the value of positive discrimination. Mm -hmm. So in Germany, there was a huge debate um, and laws of women quota. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, there was affirmative action to get more people of color into management positions. So does positive discrimination um, 
is possible in order to reduce discrimination. And I think the same question could then come up. Is it okay to exclude in order to drive inclusivity? Yeah. And then a related question to that, can we actually, is it actually a goal to be 100% inclusive? Because if we include everyone, don't we exclude? I mean, if we include everyone, we lose maybe also the purpose and the focus. Yeah, and whom I, are I we think this excluding is... if we try to include everyone? The, these are the questions that I just, I'm not sure are worth. I, to me, that's, we have created these questions by using a particular type of language to assert our goals. And to me, like that language is not at this point is not descriptive enough that I feel motivated by it, that I feel um, that I feel like it drives me or pulls me in the right directions. And instead, it leads us into like questions like this, where I'm just not sure they're worth getting into mm -hmm. in the sense that like, if if I was just like, let's just take the word inclusion, like, I, I think this would be a worthy experiment. Like, let's just take the word inclusion out. And like, now tell me what our goal is. Interesting. I had a similar chain of thought with um, what if we only focus diversity? So if the goal is to, to get different perspectives to be heard, to be included in a decision-making process, in a design process, in a development process, then the real goal is to empower different perspectives. And that's where the diversity comes in. Mm -hmm. And then does it really have to be such a loaded word like inclusion? Or is know. it- We could probably it... do the same on diversity, but that's just me. <laughs> And, like, then maybe I, it's, and is does it then boil down to accessibility? So I don't know if this is relevant, but I think it, it gets what comes to mind. I'm reading a book right now about an organizer in the American South who, um, so there's a particular part of the American South that has been like just incredibly poor, like, um, the people of that region of Appalachia have just been historically incredibly poor um, folks. And yet the natural resources of that region are huge, like coal mines and, you know, like there's just incredible like natural resources. And so those people have been exploited for like hundreds of years and, uh, and had the wealth taken out of their region while, while remaining poor. And the organizer of this book or the subject of the book and, and this organizer, like one of the things that he believes is like that the people uh, need to be empowered to know that like they have um, the power to change their own lives and they have the power to um, organize with each other and to like be resourced with each other and to solve their own problems. And so like all of that uh, he he's like such a facilitator in that way of just like I'm gonna bring these people together I'm gonna help them talk I'm gonna help them realize that they can like do this and that they can organize together and then they are going to solve their problems right to me the idea of lifting people of of people being alleviated from the suffering of poverty is like something that uh, I think a lot of like diversity and inclusion work like. I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, like we want, you know, we don't want people to be as poor. We don't want people to be suffering unnecessarily. We want people to have access to healthcare. We want all, all these things. I would have put that under this like realm of social justice, mm -hmm. right? And to me, racism, classism, sexism, uh, exploitation, all of that is like wrapped up to me in social justice. And then like some of it got brought over to DEI. Like some of like, you know, like people would be like racism, like definitely a DEI issue, right? Or like sexism, definitely a DEI issue. Classism, like, well, oh, like, oh, that's a little different. It doesn't, doesn't, I think, pull over as quickly for, for people. Um, probably because a lot of DEI comes in the corporate world, which has just no relationship to like, uh, it has a ton of relationship to poverty and, and to exploitation, but not to, we can't solve it the same way because that would actually undermine the like very structures that are 
hiring us to come mm-hmm. in, right? Anyway, I brought I brought all this up to say like that population of people is not diverse. Like, I mean, it's more diverse than you think it is, right? But like, they're like in 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 the sense that it's it's not all white, it's not all one gender. It's but but like that has no relationship to what we think of as diversity. And I don't think that the 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 people you know in that space organizing themselves need to be diverse. Like, and they're they just need to be the people, right? Who are suffering and have the problems. They need to be the the right people that are doing it and not necessarily like the NGOs and the nonprofits that come from all over the country to try to solve these people's problems. Those companies could be, or organizations could be incredibly diverse. And I don't think it would be more appropriate for mm. like- A very that. local issue. Yeah. And so like, again, like, I just think, I think it's become this abstraction. I don't know if that example was helpful at all. I don't think it was, but but like it's become this abstraction of like, we need diversity for diversity's sake. And I'm like, no, no, like we needed to recognize that we had a system that only allowed men to take, you know, ownership and responsibility and power for like many, 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 many generations. And we would like to correct that imbalance now, right? By, or like we see the, 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 we see the need to correct that imbalance. And so it's going to look like we're getting more diversity where we're just kind of like trying to correct this, like this imbalance. And and there are these like structures and systems we might need to do that. But to me, like, I don't know, to me, like diversity also can feel very hollow, mm-hmm. like, and it can feel, and, and my problem as a, <laughs> This is the part, Miriam, where I'm just like, I don't know if any of this is helpful for your podcast, but like, to me, like, I really care about alleviating the suffering of, of, of like the structural oppressions that exist. And I think there's some ways that diversity has absolutely nothing to do with that. Like, and I believe that you can have, you can have a lot of like diversity and inclusion goals that don't share any of the politics Mm -hmm. that, that feel like they get assumed by certain people when they're describing diversity and inclusion goals right and I think that's really dangerous that that like somebody could be like you know like there's just incredible inequity that 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 is pervasive and yet there's a lot of goals that we have that are are about correcting this like surface level inequity and and we have to start somewhere and save if I'm thinking, if we started at school levels, we can have school schools for boys, schools for girls, schools for people of color, schools for um, people from certain social class. We can have all these, right? And if, so if from a very young age, there's no diversity in the upbringing, then we'll have very different outcomes in when these people grow up, right? So the earlier we start, to bring diversity into the spaces, the less likely we are to end up with stubborn, ignorant, um, confrontational, um, intolerant adults. So yes, I think it's it might be a, a buzzword that is overused at the moment. Oh, we can solve world problems with DEI. Maybe not. And maybe the very first step is actually to apply more of what we consider basic facilitation skills of inclusivity, of bringing people together, of flattening the room, of listening to all voices, of uh, being open-minded, that this might actually have more impact than putting the label on every door um, and pretending that it's a big topic and bringing diversity into into conversations that maybe don't need more diversity. I think to me, what I would just say is that I would love, like on a very practical level, I would love us to, to anytime somebody says diversity, equity, and inclusion, I would love them to describe what they're talking about without using any of those words, because I think that they will get much more specific and much more usable if we start doing that. If they said like, I think we need to have more diversity in this space, I, if I was like, okay, can you say that again, but don't use the word diversity, I think people would probably go, I'd like to see more women and people of color here. 
Mm. Great. Like, cool. Perfect. We can now like decide what that means, decide what is more, figure out how to do it. Right. But I think if they say, I want more diversity, somebody could very earnestly say, you're right. We don't have enough conservatives. We need more diversity of thought and people do this and they, some, and we, I think there's a lot of spaces I'm in where people go, and I'm like, that is diversity. Everyone here, everyone here voted for the exact same person, you know, in the, in the last national election. So like, that's a fair critique. And they're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, no, because when you said diversity, you meant women and people of color. When they said diversity, they meant political orientation and neither of you said the second part, which is what do you mean by diversity, right? And to what end do we hope that that will accomplish, right? Because somebody could say, well, most of our clients, like 50% of our clients are women. And yet everybody here making this decision about this is not. So I think that's bad, you know, like, cool, perfect, you know, or like, what, there's so much more useful information that can happen when we start being more specific and we can stop having an argument about whether diversity is for this or this. Instead, we can say, I don't agree. I, I don't think we need more political diversity or I don't think we need more diversity of thought. I think we need more diversity of experience and identity. And we can have that debate instead of having a debate about what do we need more, quote, diversity, you know? So I, yeah. that would be my like those words are too big and broad to be effective at this point or to even communicate what you mean. I thank you. <laughs> I love the passion. Uh, and, yeah. I, and I, I love the exercise to, okay, what do you mean? Explain without using the words. I think that's really magic. And while listening to you, I was wondering whether it's so easy to hide behind the buzzwords in order to exactly avoid that because suddenly you have to take a stance. So do you want more women? And what does it mean? Because suddenly you become accountable for your actions. So I think if in a DEI workshop, and I think there are many of those these days, you would actually break that down and say, okay, what does it really mean? Then very quickly you are in a action decide action designing stage that feels very scary to most yes and this is why this is why like I you know like I, I I'm passionate about this because I spent many years I think having conversations that weren't worth having helping people define what we meant by diversity and inclusion like those are exercises I have done and run and you know what I don't think they did anything to move any of it forward in, in a way that the same sentence of just like, I mean, so what's funny about that sentence I said of like, say it, say it again, but use different words. That is a thing I use in facilitations. Now, anytime we're used, but anytime people are using buzzwords, because mm. I think it is so, un it, buzzwords create such incredible stories in our heads, right? And they communicate to me, a lot of people, like they communicate entire viewpoints and opinions about you, right? Just by using particular words, right? If you said fake news a few years ago, then I knew exactly what I, I was like, I got, I know what kind of political environment you're in. I know the type of news you watch. I know who you voted for. And I've got all these, and I, and I know how to dismiss you as somebody I'm not going to bother with, mm -hmm. right? Like just from the word fake news. And so to me versus if, if I was like, say that again, but don't use that term. And they were like, I have a real distrust in the media. I could be like, yeah, me too. You know, like, absolutely. Tell me about yours. Right. And, or like, tell me what you mean and why, you know, how that affects your life. Like that's a strategy that I use to stay open to people is tell me, say that again, but use different words. But I also think in this particular case with diversity and inclusion, like we do avoid a lot of hard work mm -hmm. of the next steps by getting stuck in the language and the like big picture thinking, because we don't know what the next step is. Yeah. And we don't all agree about what it means to do it. And we can stay avoidant by just staying at the high level intellectual jargon of it all. And I, yeah, it almost sounds as if um, the buzzword create a, an illusion of agreement 
or or a deep dis a, a delete deep illusion of disagreement yeah so we if we use it's polarization it, they the buzzwords create a lot of polarization it's easy to say yes 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 i agree yep. Totally. Um, we want more transparency. Yes. Okay. So we'll disclose your monthly salary. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not that kind of transparency right. that I voted for. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, on the other hand, it's um, it also buzzwords also, that's what I got from your uh, fake news example, create um, the illusion of um, in-group or it's a lingo through which you can differentiate yourself or find your tribe. Yes. And, and that, that is actually what a lot of us are doing by using particular language. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to cue to you that I'm a particular type of person, I can use certain types of, like I can use certain words to communicate that. Or acronyms, you. which are highly exclusive. Totally. So by using lingo and by using acronyms, we're excluding those who don't understand, who don't know, who haven't been educated or who are not part of the in-group. But I think, yeah, and I, I absolutely, they're exclusive. But I think, I, I guess the point I wanted to make is that um, a lot of times we're like, uh, in in some like DEI conversations that I have been in or in some of those environments that I have been in, people are like, well, I just, I was like fighting with this person, you know, like I was disagreeing with them. I was trying to challenge them. I was trying to educate them. And I'm like, no, you weren't. You were trying to cue to your crew of people that you are one of them. And you were trying to show that you're one of the good ones, right? Like, and so there's this, there's this rule called the iron law of institutions. Have you ever heard of this? No. So the Iron Law of Institutions says that we are likely to make, I think it's around, I, I know very little about this. So if somebody knows more, apologies, please correct me. So um, what, what I was introduced to it by is basically that you are going to make choices that actually indicate to people that you're a good person within your group more than advancing your group's cause. So like if say within the democratic party one of the goals is to which i don't know if it is really but like is to get medicaid uh medicaid for all right medicare for all um to pass that type of legislation that somebody in the iron law of institutions rather than making like moves that would advance that cause you will make a move that will actually just make you see be seen within the Democratic Party as like a really good Democrat, but that doesn't advance the cause. And that like to go against the Iron Law of Institution would be to be willing to advance your cause, even if it makes you less popular within your group. Mm. Right. And that most people won't. Yeah. Like most people don't, they want to be seen within the people that they care about being judged positively by. They want to make moves that are that, right? So in my example of like two participants having an argument, I'm like, you're not trying to change that person's mind. Because if you were, you would be listening to them. You'd be looking for points of agreement. You'd be open. You wouldn't be shouting. You wouldn't be using buzzwords because none of those things work, right? But what you're doing a great job of is half this room thinks you're the shit now. You know, like half this room is like, yeah, Meg knows what's up. Meg's coming with all of the like, you know, like with all of the big hitters and like coming with all the ideas, but it's not going to change anything. Mm. Right. And my, but my group's going to know I'm one of them. Yeah. And we make choices like that all the time. And it's, it is exclusive and it's to show I'm part of this group. Yeah. And when we let go of the jargon and when we, I think, actually extend ourselves towards people and say, like, tell me why you believe that. I want to know. Like, that curiosity actually can make other people less trusting of us, but can make a much bigger difference. Yeah. Reminds me of the Adam Grant's book, uh, Think Again. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how to change people's minds, actually, really. Mm -hmm. um and your 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 example is spot on and i wonder what this actually means in our daily work of facilitating group conversations mm -hmm. so how often are we actually getting trapped in these kind of conversations where it's only about looking good 
yeah and being liked and feeling liked and i think i wouldn't judge that need i think it's a instinctive human, human behavior because a sense of belonging and being accepted by our tribe is just a survival need yep so i think instinctively we all do that and we do have the choice so we don't have to do that once we are conscious i think that to me one of my like probably larger growth points as a facilitator and ideally i don't I, this isn't to say i'm over it is that like being liked by the group was really 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 important to me and i made a lot of choices at the beginning of my facilitation like journey um where i would make it so that these people would know i'm on their team mm. right and to me like that is like a um to circle back to that like idea of neutrality like that i think is a really dangerous type of move is when you're like i'm not going to do this for the good of the group i'm not doing this for the good of the group i'm not doing this so that i can advance the you know explicit outcomes and goals i'm doing this because i want these people to know i'm one of them mm. and to though i want that even like i want that person to like me you know, like I've, I've absolutely made choices where I was like, I'm doing this. So that one person goes, yeah. Yeah. And, and that I think is a really like human thing, but I think it's a really dangerous thing as a facilitator to be that level of like, in this case, like bias and willing to, to not hold back from that and decide I'm here for the good of the group. I mean, that's one of my beliefs as a facilitator is like, I'm here for the good of the group. And that means like, I'm not going to abandon any of my participants and like, let, if, if they like, sometimes it feels like your participants like chuck themselves overboard. Like they say something and you're just like, that was so out of left field. And, and it's like, we're all on this boat and we were going on this journey and then they just jumped all overboard. And you're like, what? And everyone's like, uh, that was garbage. Can we leave him behind? You know, like, can we keep going? And to me, like as a facilitator, there have been times where I'm like, yeah, he's done, you know? And it's not, it's not a, like, he needs to be removed from the space. It's not that kind of thing, but it's more that like, I can just let him go out to sea and let everybody judge him and let, and be like, you're on your own, man. You jumped overboard and I am not saving you. Right. And I think for me as a facilitator, that's a really dangerous choice because then everyone knows, oh my God, if I jump overboard, Meg's also not going to save me, you yeah. know? And we all get a little more nervous about the like safety raft uh, and whether it's going to come get us. So you have Beautiful example. Huh? Beautiful example. Yeah. Because it also, yeah, it's a, what is this? Why are you doing this job? In, and then again, the inclusivity even if it hurts, um, including the voices that hurt. To me, yeah, I think that um, this is a really like philosophical belief of mine, you know, and it is that I want to, in my spaces, I would like to create a world that, a very particular world, and a very particular experience of the world when you're in my spaces. And one of those is that you are not going to be abandoned. Like you are not going to be abandoned. There's nothing that you can say that won't make me extend towards you. Now, there might be times where you're going to say something where I'm like, I can't like, it's very, very rare, but like, it's possible that someone could come in with just so much vitriol that I might be like, I tried you, we can't, bye bye right? Like, it's not to say that I don't have boundaries, but that there, but like beyond the extreme cases where I'm like, this is absolutely vitriolic hatred that just can't be present in this space. Um, other than those extreme cases, I'm going to go get you. Like, I'm gonna be like, oh, even if I have to be like, I don't do this but whatever i'm gonna jump over the side of the boat and swim out and come in and get you and like you're not gonna just be thrown out to sea and that's what's unique about that space is like you can say something and i will not go you are on your own i am not gonna drive the bus over you i am not gonna yeah. let like versus like i'm gonna go out there it doesn't mean i agree with what you said but i'm not gonna let you 
be attacked and I'm not going to let you be for like left behind. And I totally see the beauty in it. And I see the urgency or the meaning because of what you mentioned, the signal it sends to the remaining group. So mm -hmm. if you leave one behind, then yeah, parts of the safe space is gone. It's like talking to children, you can only come back to the table if you behave. So only if you're a kind of nice person. Otherwise, you're not you're not belonging here. And this is not the space that we want to create. On the other hand, and I'm I don't have the I don't have the answer. And I um just curious how where is the balance between endangering the dynamics of the entire group? Yeah. And because yes, it's okay to slow down the entire group um to make sure that everyone is on board and has a has a place in the ship. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you don't want the the full ship to fall over just right. because the skipper is busy <laughs> swimming yes. after the one person and yes. then basically leaves the ship behind. Yeah. So how do you balance that? I think, um, so the way I would say, I have two answers. One is the amount of um, time and control that you give to the person who jumped overboard, right? Like if... Uh, I don't, I think there is an amount of time where time and energy and attention, where I think it's totally appropriate and be like, I'm coming to get you. You're coming back on board. Then we are moving on. Right. But like, you can't give them the anchor to the ship, you know, and like, you can't give them the power to steer the boat. Those are two really like important mm. things. And I think that's, there's a couple of things. So one one answer of mine is like an order of operations that like I'm gonna get you back on, but then we're gonna do something else, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna we're gonna keep going, we're gonna keep moving, but you get to be like wet and drippy over there, right? Um, but you're here and you're back, and we're, we, we can we can move we can move on now. So I have to attend to you first, and then I can m move on. And I think the only reason that people trust me when I do that is because I don't let go of the power. Like mm. I'm not, there's a difference between like, I mean, physically there is a real difference and I've done this where like, I'm handing you the mic versus I'm holding the mic mm. out to you. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, okay, I'm willing to listen. Here's your, you talk into the mic. Right. But I'm holding it. And at any point I'd be like, Ooh, you are done. You are done yeah. now. Right. Like, and that I think is a really important power dynamic to maintain is that like that person doesn't get to become the captain yeah. and that's when we don't trust what's that's when i think like the the whole ship becomes in danger is when they are given too much power to control yeah. it and that you haven't maintained your center and your ability to like steer what's happening yes awesome example once again and what I hear is it also depends with what intention the person jumps off the boat. Is it to, is it a power game mm -hmm. to distract you and to sabotage or boycott the session Yeah, just for the pleasure of it? And there are, there are people like that there are people. who just find the joy in sabotaging. Or is it really someone who has such a different belief or um, is shaken by the, the content yep. that then there is a potential opportunity in getting this person back because you need this, it's air quotes, negative energy or it's conflictual energy that can be used for something productive. Yeah. And it's not destructive per se. And I think that's the difference. That's such a good point. I think that's such a good point. And to me, like, um, it's really, so if somebody was like, how can you tell the difference? Right. To me, it would be that like, if I extend generosity, a, like a generous story towards them and assume they're not trying to capsize the boat, right? Like, I need to go in with that assumption. And then I think they, it, when you go in with that assumption, their next action, I think is probably going to tell you where it's coming from more, more distinctly. I think it's dangerous when we're like, oh my God, every person who jumps over the side is trying to capsize the boat. And it's like, no, that's not inherently true, right? Yeah. Like 
there's very specific, like I have had many examples of a participant who was like, well, woo, 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 you know, like say, said something that was dismissive or argumentative or, or, you know, just like really different than the vibe everybody else was on. And if I had just dismissed them, I think it would have been, if my first move to them would have been like, you are just trying to derail stuff, right? Like, and that's where I think the, like, um, some people are like, what do you do with the devil's advocates? I'm like, well, don't relate to them as devil's advocates. Like they, that can't be your, <laughs> like, if that's your first story about that person, it's really going to shape how you interact with them. And I think for me, I need to be able to make an initial story that is generous of that person. Mm. Like there's a workshop that I ran recently. That's about this, where I have people, there's this, um, there's this theory of needs. Glasser's choice theory has five core needs that every human has. And one of uh, their security, freedom and fun, love and belonging, uh, power and recognition. Uh, I can't, ugh, now I'm not, I should have done them in order. Anyway, so there's these five core needs. But one of the beliefs in this, in this system is that we are going to get these needs met in healthy or in unhealthy ways. Right. And so I tell the story about a participant and then I say, okay, um, look at this person through the lens of needs. Like, tell me what that story is. Right. Like, tell me what, like, how would you justify, understand, relate to his behavior? Right. Through this lens of needs. And everyone can do it. They're like, he was looking for security in this way. He was looking for love and belonging in this way. He was looking for power and recognition in this way. Right. And I was like, cool. And then I tell, I, I give this model of um, ignorant, stupid, evil. And that's how we relate to people who, when we think we're right and we think they're wrong, we go through these series of assumptions, ignorant, stupid, evil. It's mm. from a TED talk by Catherine Schultz. And, um, and I think especially around politics, especially around DEI stuff, like ignorant, stupid, evil, super powerful pattern, right? Um, and then I say, okay, now look at this guy through ignorant, stupid, evil. Now tell me the stories that you're making about him. Now tell me, how do you justify his behavior? How do you understand what? And um, people talked about how different they saw him when they saw him through those mindsets, right? They were like, if I look for needs, superhumanizing him. Like I'm, he's a person in a situation, Right. Yeah. And, and I was able to come up with a ton of needs that he wasn't getting met and that he was trying to get met in these unhealthy ways. And, and I had a lot of compassion for him and I was able to just be like, Hey, you know, like, yeah. and, and I it totally made sense. Like in this story, um, like it totally made sense. Like what you, how, how you extended towards him and how you met him and like, you know, why you were able to do that. And and then when we went from the ignorant, stupid, evil fr framework, they were like, oh, like he, he became this like archetype of just this like shitty person, you know, who's like a particular type of participant, who's this ignorant, you know, stupid white man who's coming in and saying all this ignorant bias stuff. And I, I, you know, it felt like he was attacking me and it was so personal and, and I just had no time or energy for him. Yeah. Yeah. Same dude, same story, totally different mindsets. Yes. What I what I recognize is with the ignorant, stupid, evil lens, we make it about us. Mm -hmm. And most of the times we consider someone ignorant, stupid, or evil when we feel when we feel triggered or attacked mm -hmm. by their behavior. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if we if we use the the lens of the basic needs we make it about them and we remember that they're like the thing is what's amazing is that you don't have to know their intentions mm. you can actually to me like this story that i tell like i think the fact that i related to him as a person in that moment and decided to throw him a life raft and bring him back on board, you know, like actually changed everything because it was because he was totally ready for me to dismiss him. Right. He was like, he was actually like, I think looking for a fight. Like, I think that there was a way in which he was like, you people 
you know, and was so ready for me to come back with like, well, you people, you know, and because I didn't, he was like, oh, what? And I was like, grab the dinghy. Pull and the, in the beauty now, is you know? that you might have done some deep healing inner child work where something triggered this poor person um, yep. of feeling dismissed um, as a child all day long and was kicked out of the house and was just seeking the same kind of known sensation. And there you went to rescue him and bring him on board and giving him a sense of belonging. And this might have some, yeah, deep and, impact. And I think what's to me, like if, if my story changes my moves towards him and then he doesn't meet me there, he's still trying to bring down the ship. That's when you decide for the good of the group, I need to let you go. Yeah. Right. Or for the good of the group, I'm not going to let you participate anymore. Or, you know what? I gave you some time to talk. You are continuing to take up a lot of space. And this has become about you instead of about us and what's potential for us to do together. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and like cut this off. Right. I think all of those are totally worthy choices to make, but I think sometimes we feel like we have to make that choice first before we do any of the connection mm. stuff. Like I have to cut this person off because they're saying really harmful things. And I'm like, I wonder if you can extend to them first, see if they will actually, you know, like kind of redirect or correct themselves and then you can decide to move on. Yeah. So what is the drive of our actions and our decisions? Is it our assumption of a specific behavior or driver? Or are these the facts that we can actually see? Sure. I think that's in the in the nonviolent communication um, like world. The like, I'm just stating a bunch of facts and I'm not making judgments about them. Yeah. I think that's a really beautiful thing. I think I find that really difficult. And so I actually create generous stories rather than ungenerous ones. I don't mm -hmm. create neutral stories. I'm not good at the, like, here's a, he, you know, here's a bunch of facts. Like I'm actually, I think less good at that as I am at being like, what would be the most generous story I could make mm -hmm. about this person and their actions? And if I can come up with that, then I can be like, okay, if that was happening, what would you do? And wonderful because it, you're aware of what kind of person you are and hence you are creating a nudge for yourself or a system for yourself that helps mm -hmm. you to, to deal with the situation that might be challenging for you. Yeah. People think I'm very unjudgmental because I'm able to be quite generous with people but I actually think it's because I'm incredibly judgmental and I have just retrained that muscle to continuously activate a curiosity or a generosity thing. Yeah. Like I'm like, th that's, that's the thing. Like I have a lot of judgment energy. I just have shifted it slowly over into like make generous stories of people because you, because I make a ton of stories of people. Yes. And at the end of the day, I think the more judgmental we are towards others, the more judgmental we're actually towards ourselves. Oh yeah. That's, that's my <laughs> number that's one just, target. <laughs> it's just us projecting on, I mean, it's the same for all of us, right? We're just projecting um, on others, all the stuff that uh, we're dealing with between our ears. And then um, as facilitators, we are finding ways on how do we channel that. It's so funny. I don't know why this really just striking me with you saying that, but like, I have trained myself to make incredibly generous stories of other people. And this is something that like I do, I think I started in facilitation stuff of like, I need to be able to justify their behavior in a way that allows me to make a generous move towards them. Because those are the moves that are to me, like, those are the moves. Those are the only breakthroughs I've ever had. Like, um, maybe some around boundaries where I'll just cut someone off and people will be like, wow, I didn't know you could just decide that that was enough. And that, that can be helpful too. But even that is like a, to me, like, it's still like a generous, it can, it can still come from a really generous place. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, I'm just struck by you saying that, you know, like when we're really judgmental of others, we're incredibly judgmental of ourselves. And I was like, I don't think I've turned that around. I don't think I've turned that um, power that I have done so much for other people of like creating generous stories of my participants of people in the world. I don't think I've turned that, that 
around on myself and decided like, instead of judging yourself, you are going to create incredibly generous stories of all of your actions. <laughs> Maybe that's good an call invitation. to action there. It's a yes. good call to action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I do think, um, You said, you you know, you asked a question a while ago of what about if they don't leave the space changed and, um, or you don't see the change that you wanted to inspire in someone, like, what do we do? And to like put another image that I think is really important into the world, like, and I hear this language, people say it a lot, but I don't think we take the wisdom of it, which is planting a seed. Mm. Like, I think that what we do a lot is plant seeds or we, I think that's a really, really great thing to consider that like, when you take some sort of action, whether you like when you, you know, put out an idea or are challenging somebody's beliefs that you're planting a seed and that you don't usually get to see it sprout. Like that would be incredibly fast growth, you know? And um, and that you're watering or, or that like, maybe those seeds are already there and you're just watering it a little bit. Right. And, um, to me, the, like the generosity part is like the softening of the ground that like, you might do like, if you just like drop, just dump a bunch of seeds out, like, you know, like they just sit on top of the ground and they don't ha they haven't been like, you, you haven't softened the ground for them to be in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens when you extend towards people and you create generous stories of them. And you like, say like, that makes sense that you believe that even if I fundamentally disagree with it, like it, you are, you are that defensiveness, like to bring us like full circle, like that defensiveness of like that barrier or that protectiveness, right. Is to me like that hard ground. Mm. And when I can say like, that makes sense, even if I disagree with you, or that sounds painful, or, you know, I think if I had your life experience, I would believe that too. All of those to me are like softening the ground techniques. And then I'm going to plant a seed. I'm going to be like, but here's why I think differently, or like, here's something you're not seeing, or that feeling is exactly what we're talking about. And why a lot of people think that diversity is so important is because of the, you know, this exact thing that you're pointing out, whatever it is, that's the seed. Right. Yeah. And then maybe I can water it a couple other times in the session. Like maybe there's going to be other times where they're like, Oh, interesting. Right. But so rarely am I going to get to see that sprouted. Sometimes it's a miracle when it happens. When people change in front of us, I think we should consider that a small miracle because mm -hmm. that is so tremendously difficult to do. Like to, to, to take in feedback that challenges something or information that challenges something in you to let go of your old story and to create a new one in front of people, not just one person, a group of people is such a vulnerable act. And when it happens, I think it is a tiny miracle and which it, like, which totally works for me. And I've seen it and it, ha it can happen, right? We do sometimes are like, oh my God, the thing sprouted, amazing, right? But I think we should like assure and understand in ourselves that like, just because it doesn't change in front of us doesn't mean that's not growing and doesn't mean we didn't plant the seed. Mm -hmm. And I think that in a lot of my work, I see people wanting people so desperately to change their ideas right then and there. And I sometimes joke that that is when we are planting trees on people. <laughs> like we're just like, wham. And like, to me, when you replant something that already has grown, it doesn't take as well. It like is very unstable because it hasn't rooted itself in that place, right? It's not their belief. It's your belief that you're trying to like transpose onto them. And so like, I think that's, I think it's a very understandable want. And I think it is something that I have in me for sure. You know, the more personal and important something is to me, the more I want you to believe what I believe. Right. And the more tempting it is to try to give you my thing whole hog. Right. And just be like, here is the whole thing. You don't have to grow the tree. You just go ahead and take that tree and then we can be good, you know, but it's not theirs. It's not, it doesn't, it won't have the staying power. And when somebody challenges it, 
it's really easy for it to flop over versus if they grew it from a little seedling, mm -hmm. like it will be their belief. And I think that that is something that like, yeah, for me allows me to, to, um, allows me to be guided that like, I don't want to, I don't need to see you change to believe that I'm making an impact and to like really go with this metaphor as far as I can go, I can actually flood the system and make it so that you can't grow it. Like you can overwater something and kill the potential, right? Yes. And to me, like that's when we're trying to force it to grow and that's not how things work. You can't water them more into growing faster, <laughs> right? So I think that I think as a facilitator, like that is something that I've learned is like, maybe I'm going to get to see you change. Maybe not. But if I don't get to see you change, like, have I softened the ground, planted the seeds, ideally maybe even given you some access to future water sources, but like, have I not destroyed the potential of, of that growth? Because sometimes that's what we do is we actually destroy the potential of the growth from our urgency and want to see it happen right now and impatience mm -hmm. yeah thank you my very very thorough metaphor <laughs> love the metaphor uh, it's so accurate yeah mm -hmm. thank you for the juicy conversation um anything else you wanted to get into I think it's round, full circle. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>